Christiana. I cannot think of a better guest to celebrate Earth Day this year. We just finished our spring meetings and I was so heartened to get universal support for the fund Stepping Up Climate Action. 190 countries recognizing that climate risks are macrocritical, they can undermine financial stability, and with the same token, taking action to address these risks can generate green jobs and green growth. This is at the heart of what we do at the IMF. So we embrace our role to help countries identify the right policies so they can overcome this tremendous risk to their future together. That we can build better understanding of climate risks to financial stability and help financial institutions measure these risks and manage them. And that we can help the world with data, good data, makes for good policies. So we are now launching a very strong support for policymakers to put climate data right next to and with their macroeconomic data. Last but not least, financial institutions need more capacity building and this is what we embrace as well. So we at the fund have found our calling when it comes to climate action. But a lot of that road to transforming the way we work is related to the incredible contribution of our guest, Christiana Figueres. Christiana helped the world turn a page from despair in terms of action on climate to commitment that has been now broadly known as the Paris Agreement. And Christiana hasn't stopped there. She continues to march ahead of all of us. She just published a book recently, The Future We Choose, together with somebody who was with her throughout this negotiation process, uh, Tom Rivet uh, Karnak. And uh, today we have a great opportunity to talk with Christiana about the ideas in the book and how she sees the future of our most important calling to turn the fate in the way we deal with the risks of climate change, to turn the fate of our planet and of people. So, Christiana, uh, I want to uh, start from uh, the notion of optimism, because this is what I came with from our spring meetings, feeling much more upbeat than I was a year ago. We are coming from the worst economic crisis. Many of us worried that the pandemic would push aside concerns about the climate, but the exact opposite has happened. In your book, you write about stubborn optimism as a mindset. Talk about that and welcome. Well, thank you very much, Kristalina. First of all, thank you very much for this very special invitation. It's always delightful to be in conversation with you. We, we go back many, many years before you ever uh, got to the IMF. And I must say, I have daily celebrated your leadership at the IMF because you really brought the climate change concern and the flag to the IMF and you have managed there to uh, turn around, turn the corner, I would say, and really ensure that the IMF is supporting the countries uh, who are currently so threatened by both COVID recovery and, uh, and, and climate. So thank you very much for that. Um, and, and Cristalina, yeah, stubborn optimism is actually 
what you are demonstrating uh, because it is um, it, it is not something that uh, denies the science. It's not something that denies reality, quite to the contrary. It is our responsibility to understand first the reality of science projections, secondly, the reality of where we are today, thirdly, the consequences of climate inaction, and precisely because of that, precisely because we understand the threats both to economic stability as well as to human misery. But I would love to hear it from your perspective. My sense is that the financial sector as a whole, both public and private, has never moved on both the protection against climate risks, but also the opportunities of climate action. Never seen such movement other than in the past two years. And as you say, ironically, during COVID, how do you explain that? I have two explanations as to why we are seeing stepped up engagement on climate and relentless pursuit of bringing more ammunition in this fight. The first one is uh, uh, what COVID has uh, uh, presented to all of us to see is how interdependent we are and how dependent we are on Mother Nature. And that realization, the soberness of re-evaluating what matters in life as a result of COVID uh, has helped many who might have been less interested in the issue of climate change uh, to join uh, with you and me and, and others. And secondly, we have made tremendous progress in the uh, economic and ethical case for climate action together. There has been a long time of the ethical case standing up, but climate being seen more as an environmental issue that environmentalists need to handle. Now it is for institutions like uh, the IMF a core mainstreamed issue. Why? because we now have all the uh, data we need about the risks and about the opportunities. And we also have what matters tremendously, a source of optimism that action is possible. At the IMF, we have done uh, very serious research modeling forward what would it take to meet the Paris Agreement, the one you delivered. And what this research shows is it is doable. We need a combination of three things. One, carbon price with forward guidance. So we start low, but businesses and, and uh, consumers know the price is going to go up, um, up and up. Uh, today, the average uh, uh, carbon price per ton, as you know, is about $2. By 2030, it has to be at least $75 a ton. But we have 10 years to go in this direction. Second, a investment push towards green. Now, we need this push to get out of the pandemic, of the crisis that we are experiencing today. Why not make it green? And if we go for a green investment push, combined with carbon price, we can generate additional growth of 0.7% a year for the next 15 years, plus at least 12 million net jobs, new jobs. Uh, and that has to be paired with what you know very well from negotiations, making this to be a just transition. That there will be losers. There are uh, industries, communities that are impacted negatively by the transition from higher to lower carbon intensity. But if we use some of the revenues generated from carbon price to help reskill, reprofile industries, bring science to help accelerate this reduction of carbon intensity, it can be done. So you have these three pillars, and they can work 
in a way that actually makes us better off, not worse off as a result. Uh, and that fits into your stubborn optimism, into my optimism about moving forward. Recognizing, though, that we have to very carefully pay attention to all the three aspects of our journey. Mitigation, very important. Transition, hugely important. But also adaptation, equally important. So at the IMF, we look at our engagement with countries. If they are high emitters, we concentrate on mitigation and transition. If they are highly vulnerable, we concentrate on adaptation. And by doing so, we bring the membership together. One message I heard, and I know you have heard it in negotiations many times, is please be mindful of different conditions in different countries. It has to be fair. And to finish on fairness, we also have to deliver the 100 billion a year promised between now and 2030 to the developing world so we can all pull our forces and do what your book talks about. I want to tell you my personal story when it became clear to me that this is the most consequential action I can take in whenever I am, whatever I do, to drive an economy that is in harmony with nature. Uh, 2018, remember Katowice, another important uh, milestone? Uh, and we got the IPCC report, which was much worse than previous projections, much more dire about our future. And then I saw in front of me the face of my granddaughter. And I thought, by the time she's 20, poverty will go up. By the time she's 40, migration would be massive. People would be running away from unlivable places. If she's lucky to live to be 90, the planet would be very livable. And the only thought I had at that moment was, what have we done and how can we correct it. And I think more people are like me today than they were at the days when you were driving the negotiations. And that actually takes me to, to my uh, question about the future. So there is another COP coming, COP26. If you were to be the uh, executive secretary of the convention, what would you aspire to get done? What is it that you want to see done this fall? Well, first of all, a, a couple of reactions, Kristalina. Um, yes, there are so many leaders who are reacting out of a personal motivation. And that is why I have understood that actually, surprisingly and ironically, global transformation is deeply personal. Mm. Deeply personal. Because we are understanding that this is not something about you know uh, aliens on this on this planet. Uh, this is about our own people. This is about our own descendants, and they represent. And I'm sure your granddaughter represents for you generations to come, mm -hmm. generations of young people that you have never met and you will never meet, but they are represented for you in your granddaughter. And I cannot tell you how many CEOs, how many leaders of institutions tell me stories just like the one that you have shared, because we're all beginning to understand, to really humanize this and personalize it and understand that we have a personal responsibility to use all the influence that we have at the respective institutions that we are in order to build a better world. So I am delighted if I may ask for your permission to add you to the stories that I'm collecting of personal responsibility because they, they truly are quite inspiring. Now, um, you ask about COP26, and let me start by saying I think Patricia Espinosa, as the current executive secretary, is doing a brilliant job. Mm -hmm. I also think Alok Sharma, as the incoming president mm -hmm. of the COP, is also doing a brilliant job. 
under very difficult circumstances. Because let's remember that under normal circumstances, these two people and this whole process would be meeting personally and preparing the groundwork for the results that have to occur uh, in, in November. So they're doing this under very, very difficult uh, circumstances. However, uh, let's fast forward to November and see what needs to be done. Well, the, the first thing that needs to be an outcome from COP26, and, uh, and this is agreed by everyone, is an increase in the national commitments. Mm -hmm. They're called nationally determined contributions. We had the first tranche of them being registered um, in Paris in 2015. And now it is time for countries to come together to review what they have done over the past five years, and most importantly, to come up with what are their new commitments going to be. That is why Biden's climate summit occurring at the same time as Earth Day is absolutely critical because we expect the United States to come out with their new commitment and that to then have a domino effect on other countries. We know that Europe is already at 55%. Uh, cut uh, by 2030, which is more or less where they should be. Let's remember that the, the number to keep in mind is 50% cut by 2030. Industrialized countries with the responsibility to take a deeper cut because they can in order to give more space to developing countries to be able to take less of a cut. So we are uh, very uh, excited and, uh, and, and expecting very good results from the climate summit. But by the time we get to November, we need to have all countries on board having done their domestic homework and be able to come with their new tranche of commitments, especially those that go to 2030. Because everyone has agreed to carbon neutrality by 2050, that's fine. But if by 2030 we don't put ourselves on track, that carbon neutrality by 2050 is out the door. We will never be able to have a fighting chance of that. So 2030 and one half of global emissions by 2030 is critical. The other outcome that would be critical to get uh, in, uh, in Glasgow is a price on polluting carbon. And you have addressed that yourself. And I'm delighted that you have put a price out there uh, for the future, $75 by 2030. I'm delighted that you have put that out as an aspirational price. But as you yourself said, the price right now has absolutely no impact on behavior, on policy, on, on strategy in any company. It is basically a, a symbolic price that is really having no effect whatsoever. So an agreement that would begin to put a price on carbon that starts slow, but then over time increases a, 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 a up a cost curve would be absolutely critical uh, to come from, uh, from Glasgow. And the third thing that I think is very important, and you've also mentioned it, uh, Kristalina, is the support, the financial support to developing countries who are having a much harder time both with COVID slowdown as well as with climate change impacts. That financial support has got to increase. So all of those three together would actually make for a very, not just a successful Glasgow, but actually for the step up that is totally necessary as we prepare and go into this decade. Let's remember that this is the decade. This is what yes. all of us are calling the decisive decade. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that we are privileged as human beings to be here to be at the decision table during this decade in which we are literally writing the history of humanity and of the planet into the future. It is a huge privilege. It's a responsibility that we cannot shirk. However, yes. coming off of that cloud 99 into something very specific, you know, Cristalina, I am concerned and I'm, I'm bringing my concerns to you because I know that you have thought about them that in order to be able to make these huge steps forward, economics as a profession mm. needs to also step up. 
And we need to be able to, as you economists say, internalize mm -hmm. uh, the costs of climate change, of human misery. We have to be able to put a value on natural capital so that that then allows finance ministers, central bankers to actually adopt the policies that we know they have to adopt, but it's very difficult unless we have actually internalized those costs, given a value to natural capital, giving them the world the capacity to develop business models that are capable of the kinds of transformations that we're thinking about. So um, you be my very favorite economist in the world. How are economists beginning to grapple with that huge challenge? Because that is a challenge for them. It is uh, now uh, the moment in history when all forms of capital get integrated on equal footing. Physical capital, human capital, natural capital, and the intangible capital that institutions present. Economists have come around on this topic. Uh, Professor Dasgupta made huge progress on integrating natural capital, uh, and actually in my prior life at the World Bank, uh, we had Wealth of Nations as a publication that does that. It was on the fringe, now it is mainstream. And I think it is not by chance that the managing director of the IMF has a PhD in environmental economics. We, <laughs> run, we have run out of time very quickly. Uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for sharing your thoughts and invite you to come after COP26, and then we can see whether the ambition that you described uh, and the stubborn optimism you represent uh, get us where we want to be. Uh, with this, uh, I, want, I uh, thank you very much from my heart, uh, Christiana, until next time. Thank you, Kristalina.